Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome if you just joined. Um, hopefully, you can hear me okay. I think we've just gone live. Uh, welcome if you're joining this web class. Feel free to say hi in the chat. Um, and thank you for joining on a Sunday as well. We're going to be looking at cumulative frequency graphs and box plots today, which for, hopefully for some people is a bit of a recap, uh, but it's part of the stats side of the applied part of the A-level course. And it's also probably something we might have seen at GCSE already. Um, and we're just going to be looking at it within the A-level applied setting of the maths course. So welcome, as I said. It'd be great to hear from you in the chat if you've got any questions. If you want to share answers as we go, that'd be brilliant. Cool. So we're going to do cumulative frequency and box plots. I'm about to share the screen, but do feel free to say hi and um, we'll make a start now. So let me just hopefully share the web class we've prepared. Hopefully we can see this. Welcome to anyone just joining. Uh, so we're just making a start on cumulative frequency graphs and box plots. So this is very much examinable at A level within the applied part of the course. And it is something that many of you will have seen before at GCSE. So we're going to look at a few exam questions at A level and see how they're kind of phrased, how they ask them and so on. As I said, feel free to ask questions throughout and also share answers as well as we go. It'd be great to hear from you in the chat. Right, let's make a start. So, okay, so firstly, I'm Max. I'm the lead maths teacher at Snap Provise, and I did a maths degree uh, a few years back, and then I've taught A level maths and GCSE and below ever since. So, it's been a really sort of crucial time for seeing how exams have changed uh, in that period of time. And so it's been quite useful uh, because a lot of the content has largely stayed, stayed the same, but it's been repackaged a little bit. So the courses we've designed are all very much in line with the brand new A-level. Uh, and so this topic today is part of the statistics and hopefully something we're relatively familiar with. So let's have a little look. OK, we're going to look at cumulative frequency and dealing with group data and also looking at box plots as well. So the things we're going to work through, we're going to understand what's meant by cumulative frequency and how to handle group data. Use cumulative frequency graphs to do a process called interpolation from the graph. And also look at like how to make estimates of things like percentiles, mediums and so on. Uh, we'll also be looking at box plots as well. So uh, we'll push on and make a start. Okay. So to begin with, just looking at some things that should hopefully be familiar um, and kind of prerequisite knowledge. Uh, if you're asked for, you know, from a discrete list of numbers to find things like the median, the key information to know is the total number and being able to divide it up evenly. So interestingly, when it's an odd number, the median actually falls very nicely on a specific value. Uh, so when it's an odd number, that happens. Uh, also, the key thing with the statistics at A-level is that there's a lot of calculator skills that are really important and helpful. So a lot of the summary statistics, when you're given a list of data, can be found on many of the calculators really easily. So being able to break this up um, is really important. So the one, two, three, four, fifth value will sort of represent the middle. And then we sort of look for the middles of the middles, which are like the quartiles. So we split the values up in the list. Um, let me know if you've seen this before. If you've got any questions, do let me know as well. In general, though, we can think of the median as adding one to the total and then dividing it by two. So lots of people have all these different confusing rules. If it's an odd number, you do this. If it's an even number, do this and you round up and stuff. The easiest thing that always works is if it's a fixed number of items, um, and it's discrete data, you add one to the total and half it. 
and that will always work odd or even. So for example, in a very similar way, the quartiles are like a quarter of the way through and three quarters of the way through, very similar process. And it is nice for us to just have a rule that always works. So you may or may not have done this at GCSE before, but hopefully this makes sense rather than having to list them out and cross them off. Uh, so for this, for example, it will be the fifth value or fifth term is where the middle will fall. And if we did the same for the quartiles, the 2.5 value or term, which actually lies in between three and six. So let me know if you've seen this before. Hopefully this is all very much a recap, uh, but it is taught in different ways sometimes. So um, the, the principle of a quartile is hopefully quite straightforward. It's just like a quarter of the way through the data. And so we're looking at key positions in the data when doing this. Um, so for these, we have those values. We have, we can work out the median, we can work out the quartiles. On a, on a sort of similar note, you've also got something at A-level, we explore a bit more, another measure of location, which are called percentiles. So it's a very similar thing, but instead of out of four, we're dealing with something that's out of 100, which kind of makes sense from the name. So it's the percentage of the way through the data um, that we care about. So for this, for example, if I wanted the 10th percentile for this data here, basically 10% of the way through the values, you would do 10 lots, nine plus one, over 100 and so it would be the first value okay hopefully for box and whiskers or also known as box plots we rec we recognize like what these represent and for this data here we could represent it on a box plot so the lowest value is one the highest value is 15 the upper quartile we would have found as 10 the median is seven and the lower quartile was 4.5. So these are kind of key points throughout the data that we need to recognize and understand as being quite significant positions in the data. So hopefully that's, again, very much a recap for a lot of you, but this is totally examinable um, at A-level. So we will see this in the exams and throughout the course uh, for statistics. So this is, just putting it together, this is sort of the prerequisite knowledge um, and also understanding that the middle 50% of the day, the interquartile range is what is being displayed here. And the upper quartile or the third quartile. And then the maximum. So, what we'll do, we'll move on and we'll, we'll have a little look at some exam questions and some key ideas. Um, this is something that's examinable on all the different exam boards. So it's very much a part of the A-level, whether you're doing it with AQA, OCR or Edexcel, this topic will appear. So to start with, we're gonna look at cumulative frequency graphs um, and kind of define what's going on in the background here, what, what they're all about. Um, and again, like we know, this is something you will have seen at GCSE, uh, but it's really important that we're absolutely solid with how they work and the setup. So the cumulative frequency for a set of group data is basically a running total. And as I said, do let me know uh, in the chat if you've done this before, if you're confident with this, and if you've got any questions that you'd like me to address or anything in this. So a running total of frequencies, and you can kind of think of accumulation. Um, so cumulative means it sort of builds up. So a running total of frequency up to and including that set. Okay, so. There's lots of different ways of displaying data, um, but this is a, a quite a good one for following a process that we call interpolation. 
and trying to work out what's going on within the data. So if we were to work out the cumulative frequency here, cumulative frequency, um, it's quite straightforward. And again, hopefully something we've seen before. From zero to one, we know that there's 25 in that group. Up to two, from zero to two, but well, there's 25 in that group and 30 in that group. So we're making a running total of the frequencies. So we're going to do the 25 plus the extra 30 that we've got in this group. So up to this point, we're counting for 55 data points. Then the next one, can anyone tell me what would be next? So we're looking at working out the cumulative frequency. So effectively for this interval or set, we're talking about everything from zero up to 2.5. What would be the cumulative frequency here? What would we have accounted for by this stage? So we've had 25, then we have 30. So a, a sort of grand total at the moment of 55 data points. Now we're gonna add another 40 into that. So we're gonna add that on to the cumulative frequency. Um, and hopefully we're happy that at this stage then we'll have the 55 we've already counted plus the additional 40. So this will be 95 for this one. Then we're going to add another 45 in. Oh, not 94. Hundred and forty. Then we're going to add the 40 on. And then a really good sort of sense check at the end is to actually check your up to your total. So if the thing was representing 200, whatever we were dealing with, 200 as a total frequency, we should have that by the end because we should have accounted for everything. So that's really important as well. Brilliant. So these values are the cumulative frequencies. They're what would go in this column. And now we're going to look at what we can do with that. So this is just the table of values. This is just the table of um, cumulative frequency. And now we're going to look at plotting this. So the, this is really important because I think at GCSE, people make a lot of mistakes and mix this up with frequency polygons and other things. A cumulative frequency graph, as we know, should sort of build, and it's a running total. So it basically plots the upper bound. Of each set or interval. Against the cumulative frequency. of that set. So for example, from zero, if we go along to one on the X, we know that it's up to 25. That's where it's sort of reached. By two, it's up to 55. By three, we're plotting it up at 95. And then by four, it's actually, oh sorry, by not by three, by 2.5. It's up at 95. So I'm using the end bound each time. So now I'm at this stage, by three, it's up at 140. So let's plot that in. Three is up at 140. By five, and this is where we have to be careful and it can be a little bit weird, is where the groups, the classes and the intervals are sort of different sizes or different widths. We have to pay close attention to that. I just made a mistake there myself nearly because the, the groups are different size. So um, three to five, by five, we know that it's up to 180. So at five, we're gonna plot it at 100 and 80. Plot these as accurately as I can. And then at eight, it's all the way up at 200. So they typically 
end up being a sort of S shape curve that reaches the running totals by the end of that group. Okay. So what we've got is we've got the the kind of values you can read off and work out various things. So for example, if I said um when is how many people is X or how many things is X less than or equal to 3.5, the key kind of thing for method marks is to actually show you reading this off. And this process is called linear interpolation. So you could read it off and you could go, okay. That is just under 160, maybe 155, okay, um, because it's a running total. So let me know in the chat, if you can, um, just a little checkpoint, how you feel with that content. I know for many of you, that will be very much a recap or revision, or you'll have seen it before. Um, you can just put a one, two, or a three. Um, what we're going to do is we're going to look at some exam-style questions from the A-level on this content before moving on. So if you've got any questions or anything you want to check, please feel free. We'll look at kind of exam style questions that are pitched at a level standard for this. And we'll quickly whiz through those in a second. Uh, but let me know how you're feeling with that. As I said, do feel free to ask any questions or share any answers as we go as well. So let's have a little look. Here we go. Right, so this question here. We've got the temperature of a supermarket fridge is regularly checked to ensure that it's working correctly. Over a period of three months, the temperature measured in degrees Celsius is checked 600 times. These temperatures are displayed in the cumulative frequency diagram below. Now, what is interesting here is the table that we're asked to sort of copy and complete or work on is not a cumulative frequency table, it's just the specific frequencies. So we need to be kind of very careful in how we interpret this. Now, the first group is from three to 3.4 degrees. So that's like the end of that group. So this is a really good one to start on because that first frequency, that first cumulative frequency will be the frequency of that group because it's the first group. So if I read that off, that will be 25. Going by the scale of the Y axis, which is the cumulative frequency. So hopefully that's clear. Now the next bit we need to be quite careful because the next group, is from 3.4, where we're already at 25, up to 3.8. So if we read this across at 3.8, that value there will be a cumulative frequency of 150. Now, because we've already counted for 25, the value in here won't be 150 because we're not filling in a cumulative frequency. What will it be for this one? Hi, welcome if you're there. Feel free to share any answers. So we're just looking at an exam style question of this. So because this isn't a cumulative frequency that we're filling in, and we know that it's got a cumulative frequency of 150, it's how much has it risen from 25? So in this interval, it will be 125. So welcome if you've just joined. Um, feel free to share any questions or answer these as we go. Um, so we're looking at interpreting from a cumulative frequency graph the original frequencies for the table. So now, the last final group from 4.6 here, 
we're already up to 100 and we're, well we're already up to let's see what value we're up to 550 we know that for this final group it gets all the way to 600 so this final group must include 50 as its frequency that's added on okay so hopefully that's nice and clear but this is a little bit different because this is obviously using a cumulative frequency graph to not fill in the cumulative frequencies but to fill in the original frequencies of each set of each class or interval very good so let's have a little look at uh, another exam style question of this so the heating quality of the coal in a sample of 50 sacks is measured in suitable units. The data are summarized below. So what we've got uh, is we've got the different intervals. We are also going to need to sort out a scale. Uh, and then also we're going to want the cumulative frequency as the y-axis. So along the bottom, say for example, we start at nine, it might be appropriate to use 9.2. Okay, and maybe we'll go up in fours. So four, eight, twelve, sixteen. So each four. Oops, sorry. Four, eight, twelve, sixteen, twenty, twenty-four, twenty-eight, thirty-two. Cool. OK, so what we can do here is we can almost make ourselves a little cumulative frequency table. And if we think about the coordinates we're going to use, it's going to be the endpoints of each interval. And then we're going to add the cumulative frequency in as the Y coordinates. So I'm doing a very quick table here. Of endpoints and cumulative frequencies the first one is just going to be five next one's going to be the five plus the seven so 12 then we're going to add the 15 on so 27 and then 43 and then by the end of it we reach our running total of our total frequency which is 50 so if i now plot these on now this is interesting the group is between 9.1 and 9.3 so it's actually going to start from here and the end point is here. So we're going to plot this at five, which is about there. Then at 9.5, we're going to plot it up at 12. Then at 9.7, we're going to plot it up at 27. Which should be about there. Remember the shape that this should be making as well. 9.9, .9, it's going to be up at 43. So that would be around there. And then at 10.1, it's going to be up at 50, which will be about here. And that should make, hopefully, a smooth S shape. Let's try and do this as best as I can. That's relatively good. That works quite well. So this was the x-axis. And this was, as we said, the cumulative frequency. Oh. So I'm going to move that on. Well done. Uh, now what we're going to do is going to have a little look at percentiles. So here we go. Uh, let me know if you've done percentiles before, if you recognise this as an idea. It's very much the same, and it will be tied in with cumulative frequency graphs as well. So, we can basically estimate the percentiles of group data by determining the cumulative frequency at the percentile at that point. So, by determining... the 
as we said, cumulative frequency. So from the graph, basically. And let me know if this is something you've done before, if you recognize this. Oh, good, thank you. Sorry, I've just seen the comments coming through in the chat, just flitting between the different screens. Yeah, welcome, and hopefully um, you're all doing well as well. Thank you for joining on a Sunday and watching this maths stats-based topic um, that hopefully is quite a nice one to review in preparation for exams. So we've had a little look at some exam questions already, um, but we're going to go through a few examples for percentiles here now. So finding the corresponding point on the line on the cumulative frequency graph. So for example, this might be a skill we're very familiar with. Um, for things like the median and the quartiles, you literally read off based on the total frequency, cut it in half, continuous data like a cake, the median will be the hundredth value through the list. So you go along and this process is called interpolation. And you read it off as best you can from that scale. So I'm going to go with like 2.6. And then the first, so that would be the median. And these are like straight lines are kind of like your working marks. These are sort of you reading it off. Three quarters of the way through the data would be the upper quarter. And we would use a ruler, do it as best we can. I'm going to go with that being 2.8. Uh, actually, no, that'd be more like three, three point three. The first quarter, which will be here, will be like 1.8. And then the 90th percentile, so where would this fall? If we're looking for the 90th percentile, 90% 90 of the way through the data, nine tenths of the way through the data, there's 200 bits of data. So the 90th percentile will be like the 180th value, which will be like up here. So reading that off quite nicely, we will take that as five. So that might be something you've seen as well, but it's basically 90% of the total frequency in the same way that's like very similar to what we did for medians and quartiles and stuff. You're looking at a measure of location through the data. So it's still just taking the correct fraction or percentage or chunk of the way through and doing the same process. So let's move on. Hopefully that's nice and clear. And welcome to everyone joining. Do feel free to say hi. So um, a sort of adjacent topic that's often mixed with these, especially if you're asked to do comparisons and stuff in exam questions, is box plots. Uh, and these can be linked really nicely, like, for example, with this. Uh, so a box plot, if we look at this example here, a box plot of group data can be drawn using, actually, even, oh, sorry, the estimated quartiles from the cumulative frequency graph. So let's have a little look. So for example, we read that off as 1.8. We could kind of carry that on. Uh, we can take the lowest value we might need a bit more information for, but we, we know where the median lies. And sometimes they are drawn just literally just underneath. Who has seen that before? Hi, welcome if you've just joined. 
that's okay, no worries. Do feel free to watch this back. I'm happy to review any ideas as well. Um, but thank you all for joining. Basically, um, what we've done so far, we've kind of gone over cumulative frequency and the idea of a, an accumulation of data points that generally form this S-shape kind of graph. And we've also talked about in the same way you can read off medians and follow this process of interpolation for quartiles. We can also do that for a thing called percentiles. Um, so what we're going to do, and I have seen some other questions coming in, I'll do my best to answer those, hopefully we'll have plenty of time, um, but we've done really well to get to this point already. So from the statistics side of it, cumulative frequency graphs is hopefully something you're fairly familiar with. We're also talking about box plots, um, and we'll look at how they come up in terms of exam style questions. So in terms, of, in terms of just general exam strategy, we will look at a couple of exam questions for this in a minute. Um, but my main tip I'll quickly um, suggest now for those sitting exams soon, certainly for A-level maths, is try and keep the pace up. So if you, if you turn to a question and you don't like the look of it, you might be really comfortable with something like this, uh, but you, you just open the paper and you're not happy, just keep going, just keep working and come back to it. Don't pause and linger on one question because your brain will be thinking about it in the background. So push through the paper and come back. Um, and that's the best little practice. But I'm happy to talk about that towards the end. Um, let's do a couple of exam paper questions. And if anyone has any other questions, um, I'll be happy to look at those as well. Uh, but please do keep the questions and answers coming in the chat. It's lovely to hear from everyone. Um, so the statistics is half of the applied course. It depends on what board you're with. Many of them now, you have to sort of do both. Um, so this is for statistics, yes, which is half of the applied. Uh, but yeah, as I said, I'm happy to answer other questions towards the end. So maximum and minimum values of the box plot for this are just the start and end of the graphs unless you're told any more information. And then what we'll do is I'll look at a few paper questions here now and see how we feel. Uh, but yeah, I can imagine there's obviously so much breadth to the A-level. Uh, mechanics and stats are very different. So uh, it was like a different course sometimes when you're on a different topic. Let me know how you feel with that content. Uh, and then, as I said, we'll review a couple of quick exam questions. And then if anyone has any other questions, I'm happy to answer those as well. Cool, so let me know. Brilliant, well done, that's great. Okay, so, just looking at this uh, past paper style question, uh, so it has the examination marks obtained by 1,200 candidates. Uh, they're illustrated on a cumulative frequency graph where the data points are joined by a smooth curve. Use the graph to estimate the interquartile range and X if 40% of the candidates scored more than X. Okay, so for the first part of this question, and it's very much a, a read-off type thing, 1,200, so 1,200, we know that three quarters of the way through is 900. So we're going to go across to our graph and read off what that value is. Okay, so we say, for example, 70. So Q3, and it will be hopefully a little bit of tolerance for this. Uh, and then the first quartile, should be at 300. Put that out. So Q1, let's say, is 45. And then the interquartile range is the difference of those values. So that means that the sort of middle 50% uh, of marks is spread over actually 25 marks. Now, the second question is actually a different way of phrasing the 60th percentile. So if 40, yeah. So what we've got to do, we've got to be careful because it's been worded in a slightly weird way. 
if 40% of the candidates scored more than X marks, basically because cumulative is from the start, the top 40% is like saying the same boundary as the bottom 60%. So for this one, you actually want to find the 60th percentile. Does that make sense? So yeah, the calculation for percentile sounds great, but do look out for this because it's obviously done from the bottom upwards. The wording could be kind of catch us off guard a little bit. So we're going to look for this will actually be the 720th value, which will be, let's do it as best we can. Coming up about, I think that's about 63. Okay. So 40% of candidates got higher than that. 60% scored that value or lower. I think that's the boundary we're at. Okay, excellent. Now, another way to use these kind of graphs is the number of candidates this is asking for who scored more than 68 marks. So this is kind of the other way around. Now, also, we need to pay close attention to if it says more or less, because remember, cumulative is from sort of bottom upwards, from zero upwards. So it's very easy to just read that value off, which I think I make that value um, sort of about 860. So it's very easy to just say 860. That's how many people got less than 68 marks. So we need to do 1,200 minus that to see the amount that got above it. So I think that's going to be 340 candidates that scored more. Hopefully that's making sense and we're happy with that. And these are good questions to look at because they sort of do represent what we would expect to see in an exam. So it's subsequently discovered that candidates' marks in the range 35 to 55 were evenly distributed. Now, this is an excellent change to the question uh, because I can see them doing this, anything like this in the exam, and it would throw off a lot of students. So this is a really good one to look at. Uh, need to tweak the graph, basically. So it says, we were using this process of interpolation where we were using a curve. It now says, it's discovered that between 35 and 55 in that mark range, that it was evenly distributed. That basically means it's not following a curve. Between those points, it's a straight line. It's an even distribution. It's increasing at a constant gradient. So what we would have here is that between 35, let's just get that point on there, and 55, was it? Yeah, 35 to 55 that we're going to actually have the graph should actually have been that shape and it's always good to look at questions like this because this is what catches us off guard in the real exam does that make sense to everyone do we see why i've made it a straight line it's actually found that we've we've made this assumption that it's following this nice smooth curve initially but now we've been given a bit more information that this is actually a straight line. This is evenly distributed. In that interval, there's a very specific thing going on. So it's a bit strange because we might not have seen a question like that before, but does that sort of make sense for why we've had to add that in? Because they're not asking us to do much. They're just asking us to sort of comment on what this would change. So what does this information suggest about the estimate for the interquartile range? Now, if we look back at what we did for our interquartile range, interestingly, the lower quartile at 300, we read it as this value, but we're looking at the shape of this and we would actually hit that line earlier, meaning that the, the lower quartile would be a lower value. Does everyone see that that's basically what we can obtain from it? If the graph was a slightly different shape at that particular point, we haven't got to actually necessarily recalculate it. Uh, but what we can see is that the shape will be different. And we need to comment on that because we would have actually hit the graph 
at an earlier point, thus meaning that the Q1 value would be a little bit lower. And what would the knock-on effect of that be? That would actually mean that the first quartile value we calculated was too big. And so that the interquartile range was actually smaller than it should have been. So let me just rephrase that. Let me just write that out. But please do ask any questions if that wasn't clear, because it may be that you haven't seen a question like this before. So the first quartile, Q1 value we calculated was too high. So it was greater than the true value now that we've got this extra information. So the shape of the data is a little bit different than we first believed. This means that the IQR was probably smaller. Than the true value, the IQ, the IQR should actually be a little bit wider in reality. The interquartile range, because we should have actually minus off an even smaller number. So, so the IQR that we calculated was probably smaller than the true interquartile range than the true value. Does that make sense? Please let me know if you need that clarified or anything. Um, but it was a nice little extension to something we're hopefully quite comfortable dealing with, um, but maybe a little bit different to the style of question we've seen before. Cool. And I'm happy to backtrack or anything. If anyone has any other specific questions. Let's do another sort of more standard question though. So here we go, 200 lambs. Uh, and it asks for the percentage of lambs with birth weights over six kilograms. So again, this is a more than one. So there's six. Now remembering the cumulative frequency does the sort of less than and up to running total. So less than or equal to would be representing 160 lambs. Out of the 200, that would therefore mean that hundred, sorry, 200 minus 160 is how many are greater. So approximately 40 lambs will be above that weight. Okay, so that will be the answer for that one. Then it says estimate the median and the interquartile range. So for the median, we're going to go across from the hundredth uh, data point all the way down. I'm going to read that off as 5.2. So the median, which sometimes is called Q2, the second quartile, uh, we're going to go with 5.2 kilograms. Then we'll go to 50 for Q1. And then we'll do Q3. Oops. So Q1 is 4.2 kilograms. And then Q3 which will be this value here. Looks like that's at 5.8. And then it asked actually for the interquartile range. So we're gonna do this one, take away this one. So the middle 50% of the data is spread across 1.6 kilograms of sort of difference. Good, right, I think we've got another exam question to just look at. And as I said, if you've got any questions, do feel free to ask. So this time we've got a box plot or a box and whisker um, that shows the weight of 100 lambs from the Welsh mountain sheep, um, as opposed to the previous lot that we just had, uh, the crossbred sheep there. So it says use appropriate measures to compare briefly the central tendencies and variations of the weights of the two types of lamb. Okay, this is a really important question to look at because comparisons is often something that we're asked to do. Uh, 
and it, they've really sort of spelled it out for this question but, but we need to know what to look for so we need to compare measures of spread and measures of central tendency so i'm just going to write in the key details from the previous slide so that we've got everything to compare so we just worked out 5.2 we just worked out an iqr and they do want you to do specific comparisons as well um we also had maximum value on the last one of 8.8 .8. okay so what we can do is the comparison well for the for this one here the welsh uh mountain sheep here we've got a median of 3.6 and we've got an integral to our range. If we do this one here, 3.9 minus 3.1, the IQR is 0 0.8. So then when we comment on this, we can say that the mountain sheep, and you might have done loads of questions like this. I'm not sure you might have done this at GCSE. The comparisons are important though. So the mountain sheep, let's have a little look. Um, mountain sheep have a smaller median and the cross sheep Um, so basically, what does that mean? So basically, our light up on average. Uh, they also have a smaller range. And interquartile our range as well meaning the spread is less, so they're more sort of closely linked together. So range and interquartile range. So the spread, the variation and stuff is really important to comment on as well. So they have a smaller range and interquartile range of weights. And you can use specifics since we've got them. Um, that's all sort of summarised there. So with comparisons, the key things to remember I don't just compare an average and don't just compare the spread. You have to compare both to give the full picture. Um, almost like if you were asked in a, you, your class for doing an exam at school and then the, another class was doing an exam as well. And you took your two averages of your different classes and you said, OK, who did better? Don't just compare the average or the median or the mean. You also have to look at the spread because you might have a higher average, but actually the best and worst, there might be a much bigger gap or divide or variation between the groups. And that's what we're looking at here as well. Okay, so there were really good exam style questions to look at, uh, particularly this one, I think. I think this was really good to see. Um, so that kind of brings us to the end of the that stuff we've looked at there. We've looked at cumulative frequency and how to handle group data. We've looked at the idea of percentiles because that will be used as measures of location, how to draw box plots from the group data and the cumulative frequency graphs that we have. Uh, so that was really good. Well done following along with that. And thank you for joining in, especially on a Sunday. If you have any questions for me, let me know. I know many of you are in exam mode early on in the academic year already. And uh, you, you have a, a very good awareness of how much breadth there is to this course. So this is obviously part of the statistics side of the course, but the mechanics is very different. And also the pure maths gets quite involved quite quickly as well. So really well done. We have got upcoming YouTube sessions on Sundays as well. So there will be another maths one uh, in the not too distant future. And you can look at that and schedule it and set reminders and stuff. Um, do feel free to ask questions. Do also feel free to um, check out the Stat Revised platform and the website uh, where the whole course has been broken down 
Uh, we have web classes and lots of content on there as well. Uh, but yeah, these YouTube sessions will be running um, for the sciences as well. Let me know and thank you to those that did take part in the chat, sharing answers and questions today. It was lovely to hear from you. Uh, but yeah, as I said, that's quite a nice topic to review. It's one that you're hopefully familiar with, but still need to pay close attention to detail and the wording in the actual exams. So very well done with that. Let's have a little look. Yeah, so if you do have any questions, let me know. Otherwise, I think I'll stop sharing that there. Uh, I think it was good to go through the exam questions today uh, and hopefully that was useful. Uh, let me just see how we're doing. Yeah. Well done. Yes, as I said, thank you for taking part in that, asking questions and so on. Well done today. Um, thanks very much. That's great. Hopefully we'll see you at a web class soon. Um, and as I said, look at the YouTube schedule for the live sessions. Um, we do cover all the different bits of the course. But as, as we mentioned, there's a lot of breadth to the content there. So good luck this week. Well done. Uh, keep well and um, hopefully see you at a web class soon. Thanks, guys. Take care. Well done.